I spent $1,000 on a ticket to Vid Summit and got to learn from top creators like Mr. Beast, Ryan Trahan, and Zach King. And in this video, I'm going to be teaching you everything I learned about how to grow your YouTube channel authentically in 2023. So you're probably wondering what I learned from Mr. Beast. Well, to be honest, I'm a big fan of Mr. Beast. And so I kind of knew a lot of the stuff that he already talked about on stage, but I'll share some of my favorite takeaways. So Jimmy talked about the difference between average view duration and average view percentage. YouTube used to give preference to average view duration, meaning the actual amount of time that someone watched a video. But this meant that they were actually preferring longer videos and pushing shorter videos down in the algorithm. So now they're paying much more attention to average view percentage, meaning what percentage of people actually watched your video from the very start to the very end. If you look at your viewer retention graph, a lot of people are gonna drop off in the beginning. If it's a really steep drop off, you're gonna wanna make sure you change your intro to make sure that it matches what your title and thumbnail are conveying. But the biggest way that you can improve your overall average view percentage is to make sure that you don't have these really long outros that make people drop off before they make it all the way to the end. If you watch a Mr. Beast video, you'll notice that he ends the video very quickly after the payoff. If you haven't already subscribed, we can get you another video. Goodbye. Sean Cannell calls this landing the plane. And as soon as the viewer feels like the plane is starting to land, they're going to start scrolling and looking for the next video. So don't give them that opportunity to leave the video before it's done. One of the questions that Jimmy was asked was about chapter markers on YouTube, which are the little dividers in the playhead of the video that show people the different chunks of the video so they can kind of skip around. The question revolved around whether this was a good idea or a bad idea. And Jimmy said that as long as it's improving the viewer's experience of watching the video, it's always a good idea. When asked if this was going to lower the average view percentage because people are going to be skipping around, Jimmy simply responded that you should try to make your video as entertaining as possible so that people aren't encouraged to skip around, but they still have the ability to do so if they get bored. Chapter markers help people find a part of the video that they might be more interested in instead of just simply leaving your video, which you definitely don't want them to do. And personally, I love chapter markers and I think they're a great addition to YouTube. Mr. Beast is also super bullish on YouTube shorts, especially because now YouTube shorts algorithm actually influences what your long form algorithm is gonna look like. So if you watch a short from somebody, you're now going to get recommended a long form video from that same person. The biggest thing to keep in mind is to make sure that the type of content that you're making in your shorts is complementary to the type of content you're making for long form. We all know that Mr. Beast is obsessed with thumbnail and title, but with the YouTube short, there is no thumbnail and title. So he said that the hook, which is the first one to three seconds, basically is your title and thumbnail. So you better make sure it's good. We just posted a whole video about all the changes coming to YouTube, including a lot of changes around YouTube shorts monetization. So make sure you go back and watch that video. Another fun fact about Mr. Beast is before posting a video, he makes tons of thumbnails. He'll make like four or five different concepts for the thumbnails and then four or five different edits of those concepts and then he sends out a template of all the possible thumbnails to his friends and they all get to vote on which one they think would be the most clickable speaking of thumbnails there was a lot of talk about thumbnails at vid summit so i think i'm gonna actually just make a whole video soon all about thumbnails but i'll give you my favorite takeaways ryan trahan has four things to keep in mind when making a YouTube thumbnail. Number one, does it pass the squint test? If you squint really hard, can you still understand and make out what's in the thumbnail? That is super key because you have to remember that thumbnails are appearing on devices in all different sizes. So if it's not obvious immediately what the thumbnail is, no one's gonna click on it. The second thing is too much information is no information. Keep your thumbnails simple and clean. If you have too much going on, it's too busy and it just looks like a whole bunch of nothing. Number three is color blocking. Use color blocking to separate different pieces of your thumbnail and make different things stand out. And number four, subtle conflict is better than crazy faces. We've all seen YouTube just littered with crazy reaction faces, but Ryan says that subtle conflict is really the main emotion that causes that curiosity to get people to click. Rather than like, ah, I'm so scared. Like if you kind of give this like subtle scared, like it kind of seems more realistic and it makes people actually curious of what's gonna go on in that video. Another huge takeaway I got regarding thumbnails is that a good thumbnail doesn't make up for a bad video idea. It doesn't matter how awesome your thumbnail is, just make a good video. And I think one of the most underrated parts of thumbnails is the environment in the thumbnail. 
We all know it's really popular to put a face in a thumbnail, and we all know that faces are very clickable in thumbnails. Too many faces is bad, but one or two faces is great. But what's the environment in the background saying about the video? The environment is so underrated, but if you look at really good thumbnails, they have great environments in the thumbnail, and that says a lot without having to say a lot. Ryan Trahan also doubled down on this idea that your videos should be a gift to the audience. You should be trying to make the best possible video for the audience, and they should feel amazed to unwrap and watch this video all the way to the end. Anything less than that is simply just disrespecting the audience, and they're gonna be less likely to click on one of your videos in the future if you're not thinking of them first. And the last big takeaway that I got from Ryan is to really evaluate yourself and try to figure out what type of YouTuber or creator you are. Who are you in public? What are your negative traits about yourself? What are your positive traits? And who are you in private? Who are you in secret? What are the things that you search on YouTube that no one else knows about? What are those topics that you just nerd out about that maybe you feel like you can't portray? Those are the things that you should actually double down on because those are the things that are gonna make you unique and those are the things that are gonna keep you passionate about making videos. Up next is Zach Final Cut King. I was really excited for Zach's speech because his process is very similar to the process that we're using at 4Media, where we're making videos for clients. Zach makes these high production videos that still feel kind of homegrown, but just have this amazing sense of magic and you just wonder how the heck he did it. I think the biggest takeaway I took from his speech was about his actual creative process. So it starts with ideation, where his team basically just throws out all the blue sky ideas that they have, and no one's allowed to shoot down any ideas during this phase. Anything goes, anything gets thrown up on the wall, and they do this with sticky notes, where they'll literally have a wall full of sticky notes by the end. Then they move on to refinement, where everyone gets a vote, and they get to actually go up to a sticky note and put a little tiny sticker on their favorite sticky notes. This leads to some interesting findings because sometimes the ones that get the most votes aren't always the most obvious ideas, but that means they're the ones that people have the most passion around and are most excited to try to bring to fruition. Obviously then it moves on to legal and the finance team to see if it actually makes sense. But during this time is actually when they figure out how to evolve the idea. And typically what they started with is not really what ends up on the screen, but because they went through the process of this ideation and just throwing ideas around, they might be able to combine some ideas or just figure out how to evolve the idea in the best way possible. Another thing they do with this process is a thing called a T-sheet, where on one side of the T, you have a written down idea. And on the other side, you draw a picture. Some people understand through words, some people understand more visually, so having both of these side by side really gets the point across about what the idea really is. They'll make some mock-up type videos where Zach isn't really involved, but maybe someone on his crew is gonna be the fake character, and they'll act out the scene in the most crude possible way, just so that they can visually get an idea of how the video is gonna go before they actually go on set, buy all the props, buy all the costumes, and just figure out if it's gonna work on camera. He says that it's also important to not fully flesh out the idea and to leave about 10% on the cutting room floor so that on the day of production, there's actually a little bit of room to still mold the idea and maybe even change it just slightly and bring it up to 100%. They'll make sure they get their final shot take a break, maybe take lunch, and then they'll reconvene and talk internally if there's any way that they could possibly do the shot one more time and make it a little bit better. He said this part can make all the difference. Zach also talked about stealing like an artist, which is something that Foot Crunch also talked about in his speech. So one of the examples that he gave was he found a video that was really popular that was about spending $1,000 on upgrades to something. And so what he did was he twisted that niche, which for him is making videos about playing FIFA, and he spent $1,000 on upgrades in FIFA in 24 hours or something like that. And it blew up because it was already a proven concept with another niche and he just made it his own. Another thing that he brought up was in his videos, he likes to create tension where he makes people feel like the video is just about to pay off and then he has to overcome another obstacle or he's just about to get to the end. Oh, he's so close. And then he fails and he has to come up with another thing or do another thing before he gets to the end. So creating that sense of tension, it makes people feel like they're about to get what they want, but then, oh man, something happened. Oh man. So if you can kind of create that tension throughout the video and make it 
always feel like you're right on the edge of making it happen, that will keep people's attention and keep them sticking around. One of my next favorite speeches was from John Ushai, and he used to work for Instagram. Then he went and worked for YouTube, and now he's just a creator making videos. One of the things he talked about was the difference between celebrities and creators, and why some of the best and biggest celebrities these days actually are creators. One of the examples he gave was James Corden, and how his variety show has gone through so many different iterations because he actually comes up with very creative segments for his show. Instead of just doing the typical bring a guest on, talk to him, the interview thing, he's come up with really creative segments like Spill Your Guts or Fill Your Guts and Carpool Karaoke, which are super popular segments and they do way better on YouTube than they actually do on TV. So what John talked about is how can you make a variety show for your thing? How do you come up with different shows for your niche, for your channel, and what would those look like? And if your variety show has too much variety, it's not going to work. The last thing he talked about that I thought was super interesting is the idea around shorts. And he says that if you can't record at least three shorts in an hour, the concept is probably too complicated and you should move on. Short form content needs to be simple to the point and the concepts need to be straightforward and you should be able to execute them pretty quickly. Speaking of YouTube shorts, Eric said that you should be uploading two YouTube shorts for every one long form video. And he said not to over index on shorts or else you'll just be known for your shorts and not for your long form videos. And probably the most insightful speech came from a guy named Tim Schmoyer. You probably haven't heard of him before, but he is deep in the YouTube data game and his company recently got acquired by vidIQ. He talked about how YouTube over time has started to prioritize different things. So from 2005 to 2012, YouTube was pretty much all about views and keywords. So you could kind of game the system and skew the SEO by putting in certain keywords to make your videos pop up more frequently. Then in 2012, they shifted their focus towards watch time. Overall watch time of your channel was one of the biggest metrics of growth on the platform. YouTube realized that this was a mistake. Channels that were uploading every day or channels that were uploading really long videos were getting prioritized over channels that were uploading shorter videos or channels that uploaded really high quality videos but maybe didn't upload as frequently. So in 2016, they pivoted towards a machine learning approach that was designed to keep people on the platform longer and recommend videos that you wanted to watch. But what they soon figured out is the videos that you want to watch aren't always the videos that make you feel good and that staying on YouTube for hours and hours and hours leads to an unpleasant experience for the viewer over time and they start to regard YouTube as a place that doesn't really make them feel good. So in 2019, the biggest metric that YouTube prioritizes now is satisfaction which is pretty interesting and it's hard to quantify, but YouTube is doing its best to make sure that every person has a great experience on YouTube and leaves their viewing session feeling better than when they started. This means that every person's YouTube homepage, search, everything really is different than the next person, meaning that ranking number one isn't really a thing anymore because what's number one for me is gonna be different than what's number one for you. So YouTube, SEO is kind of dead. What you should be prioritizing is just making really good videos and making videos that actual humans want to watch. You don't have to gamify this SEO game and pick all the correct keywords and make sure that uh, everything is optimized. YouTube's machine learning algorithms and AI image analyzation is state of the art and they know exactly what's going on in your videos to the point that it's actually kind of scary. Tim actually showed on screen in real time what YouTube's algorithms were analyzing and it was pretty freaky how accurate it was and it gives a percentage of how confident it is in that something is on screen or not. So there's like a woman on screen, it might be 95% confident that it's a woman, but 50% confident of who that woman actually is based on what her face looks like and other content that she's in on YouTube or all over the rest of the internet. So Tim said the biggest thing to do is to optimize for your audience's curiosity. Figure out who your audience is and tap into what they want to actually see. And the last big takeaway I got from him is that your niche doesn't have to be a topic. It could be a state of mind or a belief that you have. Your audience typically isn't just interested in one thing and you as a creator probably are also interested in multiple things. So your niche doesn't necessarily have to be about 
one specific topic, but more a state of mind. Overall, it seems like the biggest trend in YouTube right now is to just make great videos. Figure out what your audience wants and figure out how to best serve them by giving them the best content possible. Try to provide actual value and leave the viewer more fulfilled than when they arrived. Make videos that make people feel good, that they made the right choice to click your video and stick around to the end. And overall, don't try to game the system, just make great videos. Hopefully you guys liked this video. If you did, hit that subscribe button and we'll see you in the next one.